Welcome to the February meeting of the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. I'm Becky Strickland, Secretary. Fact began in 1995. We support science, reason, critical thinking, and the thorough investigation of claims using the scientific method. Please see our website, www.fact.org, to join for $25 a year. Your membership and donations help us sponsor quality speakers like Faith Lamb, pays our Zoom and meetup costs, and funds activities such as our May excursion and summer picnic, which are free and open to all. Now some specific information about the Zoom meeting. There is a Q&A box for questions at the bottom of your screen. You can type them in at any time. Please make your questions concise. There is also a chat box at the bottom of the screen that, that allows you to communicate with each other or with the meeting organizers. I'm the person who's doing the Q&A. I will not be monitoring the chat at all. So if you have a question, put it on the Q&A. Today we have David Cregan, a longtime board member of FACT, and Faith Lamb, a journalist and longtime friend of FACT. This is not Faith's first time speaking for our group. We also have Eric Krieg, a founding member and longtime board member, and he is going to introduce Dave and Faye. Eric? All right. Thank you very much, Becky. <clears throat> First of all, for future meetings, our next meeting coming up on March 19th will fe feature member Robert Palmer interviewing uh, Dr. Robert ba uh, Bartholomew, and he's an American uh, medical sociologist, journalist, uh, uh, in, in with the Department of Psychological Medicine in the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He's written for many years and many publications, including the leading skeptical publications on mass hysteria and psychogenic illness. So he has, uh, th these things come up, you can count on them at least every five years somewhere in the planet. And the most recent one in the news was the uh, Hanover kind of conspiracy theory of uh, our embassy being invaded. So he'll give uh, a long researched uh, review perspective on mass hysteria and uh, psychogenic instances like that. Then in April, we're not completely sure who we'll have for that, but if you stay tuned on Meetup and Instagram, Twitter, our webpage and email list, we'll get you more information on that. Um, both of these two meetings are on where we usually meet the third Saturday of the month, and they will also be online. We don't know if in September we'll be able to return to the university. When we do, it is our hope to be there in person like we used to do, but then also simulcast uh, on the web. And then we'd have the freedom to have remote speakers, not necessarily always in person um, like we're doing right now. Every year in May, we also have an expedition, which is like a real life thing in person. This one will be May 7th at Valley Forge, meeting uh, at the visitor center area for just a little bit of a walk in the area, picnic, and just a little bit of information about the history of uh, that really fascinating and beautiful site. So uh, that'll be then. So our event for today will feature our member, uh, long longstanding fact supporter and board member, David Cragen, interviewing uh, journalist Faye Flam. David is uh, a director of quality assurance for a leading pharmaceutical company specializing in risk assessment. And he also teaches as an adjunct professor uh, for Peking University. Um, he'll be talking to a, a longtime great science journalist from th this area, Faye Flam who's written a number of books and long covered pseudoscience, irrationality, and challenges to science. She'll be uh, discussing uh, the media coverage, particularly of the pandemic, where if you look at her Bloomberg uh, articles and in other forums, she's really done an excellent fair job of presenting this changing field of COVID that's become so politicized and so controversial. So, uh, to take it away, uh, David Cragen, and uh, th thank you, both of you. Thank you, Eric. 
as Eric mentioned, I work for a large pharmaceutical company. However, what I'm going to talk about today represents my own opinions, my own views. And I can say that in my entire career, I've never discussed a topic publicly that I have more misgivings about than COVID. I've talked, I'm a toxicologist by training. I've talked to kids in school, even elementary school kids about animal testing. When I was in graduate graduate school. I was in a televised discussion on animal testing. I've discussed many things, but the polarization on COVID makes this such that this is such a sensitive issue. And it's really my pleasure to do this with Faye. Faye and I have known each other many years. Originally, we met through FACT and we've given multiple, done multiple sessions together since then. And I thought, to set the stage about what's going on regarding COVID in the media, it's helpful to, to talk about risk communication. And I've taken countless risk communication courses and read countless articles, and I've taught it myself in Europe, US, and Asia. And of all the training I've gotten, there's one individual who's particularly insightful and someone who Faye has interviewed in her podcast as well. And that's Peter Sandman. And I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna offer some of his perspectives first as, as a framework to help us think about, okay, what's going on with COVID? Why do people, why do people, um, are they reacting like they are? So let me just switch, switch to that for a moment. The issue with, with risk is that experts respond to risk. The public responds to outrage. When risks are high and outrage is low, the public will be concerned. I mean, the public will be unconcerned, but the experts are concerned. When risks are low and outrage is high, experts will be unconcerned, but the public will be concerned. To understand how this happens, I'm gonna discuss Sandman's 12 principal components of outrage. But before I get to that, I wanna set the stage a little bit more on risk communication. I'm gonna talk about a risk assessor's view of risk versus that of a risk communicator. As a risk assessor, the formula for risk assessment is standard. It's hazard times exposure. That's true whether we're talking about engineering risk, financial risk, or health risk. Sandman's formula is risk equals hazard plus outrage. When I took the first class from him and I saw him present that, I thought, he's wrong. That's the wrong formula. But I came to realize he's correct, that even if there's no hazard, if there's high public outrage, risk is seen as high. And I'll I'll explore that more. The risk communication problem is, is that the risks that concern people and the risks that kill people are completely different. Some risks kill many and upset few. Other risks kill few, but upset many. And we can look across the world at countless risks where we see this happen. Think about this, what outrages people more? cigarettes or a Superfund site? What injures people more? Cigarettes or a Superfund site? If something's classified as a Superfund site, we, we view it with dread. We're concerned about it. And we can see that in terms of how dollars are spent. Even if we go back more than 20 years ago uh, to um, risk benefit uh, economists from Duke and from Stanford did an analysis of the money spent on Superfund sites. They found that the average cost to prevent a single hypothetical cancer case was $11.7 billion. That's not million, it's a billion dollars. And that, and that was a large amount in 1999. It's a large amount today. Why is it so much? Because we're outraged about Superfund sites. That scares us. So we're willing to spend a lot of society's monies on that. There's a low correlation between what kills us and what concerns us. Think about current risks. 
most of the current risks are invisible. We don't see them. Whereas historically through human evolution, risks were visible. Is it a dangerous animal that's going to kill you? Are you dying from famine? Those were risks that were visible. Modern risks are often invisible to us. We'd like to think that we can solve a risk by, by sharing information. We want to believe you give people information, it changes their attitude, changes their behavior. Let's take some specific examples though. Seatbelts, smoking, diet and exercise. It's taken decades to influence people's behavior. And still, we have a lot of people who still smoke. We have a lot of people who still don't wear seatbelts. The data on them are very clear and we have decades of data on it. Think about the difference with COVID. We had to make decisions on COVID very quickly, often based on very limited amounts of information. And, and so that caused concern with, with the public with people, and it's a challenge for the media to cover it. It's a challenge for scientists to cover it. So to explore this a bit more, I'm gonna talk about Sandman's components of outrage. And I'll take it away from COVID for a moment since that is so polarizing. And let's take two other things, cigarettes versus food from gen genetically modified organisms. Credible scientific groups and regulatory agencies across the globe have concluded that the risks from GMOs are no different than those from conventional breeding practices. You can go to China to their GMO Biosafety Committee. You can talk about in the US with the Food and Drug Administration, the European Food Safety Agency, Society of Toxicology, National Academy of Sciences have concluded, made similar conclusions. Even in Europe, where there's a very strong public feeling against GMOs, European Food Safety Agency again and again has concluded that GMOs can be safely consumed. They don't present a risk to the environment. In contrast, cigarettes kill in the US about 480,000 people a year, many more across the globe. Why do GMOs scare us more? Well, we can explore that by looking at Sandman's principles of uh, compo principal components of outrage. What this is, a, is a tool to help us understand how people, how humans react to risks. If something appears more in the left column, we see it as safer. If it appears more in the right column, we see it as risky and it outrages us. So I'll take you through a couple examples. Think about smoking. Cigarettes present a top avoidable risk, yet they fit many of the categories of safe. They're voluntary. People might think of them as natural. They're familiar. I can remember my grandmother smoking. They're not memorable. What does that mean? Well, the 480,000 people that die a year, unless it's your family, unless it's your friend, they tend to be hidden from us versus something like a plane crash. A plane crash with 80 people grabs us. It, it, it grabs our attention because it's very memorable. So we see things that are memorable as a much higher risk than things that aren't memorable. Another thing that Sandman said that surprised me is chronic. Before his training, I would have thought chronic risks scare us more. But the, the opposite is true. Think about this. Um, I'm eating potato chips. I know I eat too many calories. I know I would be healthier if I ate less calories, but I like eating potato chips. Well, that's because the risk is chronic. If I knew eating potato chips would make my toes fall off tomorrow, I would stop immediately. But because the risk is chronic, we see it as safer. Smoking is knowable. It's individually controlled. It's fair. We don't expect any part of the society to smoke. It's morally irrelevant. What does that mean? Well, murder 
is, is morally relevant. It's an absolute wrong to society. A person's decision to smoke is a tragedy, but it's their decision. So that's why it's not morally relevant. If we switch over to GMOs, think about how many of the categories they fit on the right or how opponents of GMOs make us want to think they fit those categories. For example, coerced. Farmers make a decision to use GMO crops because there's a positive cost benefit. They get better yields at a lower cost. But the opponents of GMOs try to imply that farmers are forced to use GMO seeds. To some people, GMOs might seem industrial. They seem exotic. They're unknowable. Unless you have deep molecular biology knowledge, you may not fully understand how GMOs are used. They're controlled by others. And the opponents of them will try to emphasize that the sources of information are untrustworthy and it's an unworth, unresponsive process. My view as a scientist is there's lots of good credible information on GMOs, but in the public arena, that's not how it often comes out. So if we think about the mRNA vaccines, think about yourself personally, where do you put them in this chart? Um, the vaccines are coerced. They're required by the government. Now, I would say, I think that's a good idea. I think it's good for the government to require them. However, it does increase the perceived risk of those vaccines because they're forced. They can be seen as industrial and exotic and unknowable. They're controlled by others. And the opponents of them would like you to believe it's untrustworthy sources and an unresponsive process. However, as I'll cover in just a couple more slides, in fact, the US FDA has had a very open process regarding its vaccines and the, the scientific committees that have discussed them. And it is a responsive process. The public was allowed to give comments on them. But these are the kinds of things that thinking about what people perceive as risky, what, perceive, what we perceive as safe helps give us insight to see why are there such different opinions on mRNA vaccines. I mentioned the discussions on the vaccines are open. I'm just going to give a couple screenshots to show that if anybody questions how did FDA approve the Pfizer vaccine, you can go to FDA's website. All of the material Meeting materials are there, and the discussion is available on YouTube for you to watch. And there's so many meeting materials, I couldn't put it on one page, but all of that information is there for you too. So if you have questions, how was this discussed? How did they decide? You can go there. And the last thing I'll say about these advisory committee meetings is they are open forums for discussion. In some of the, the advisory committees, they vote all against an issue. Some, many people vote for. Sometimes it's split 50-50. There was just a discussion a couple weeks ago about a new anti-cancer drug. And I think the number was 17 voted against it, one voted for it. And a colleague, a professional colleague said, what do you think about the person that disagreed? I said, I think that's healthy. I think that's good that people are willing to speak up and give differences of opinion. That's what we want. So to summarize, principles of risk communication can help us understand how the public reacts. If you're interested, you wanna know more, you can go to Peter's site, it's available. And he has one of his books, a book of his freely available. It's from 1993 but what he says is very relevant today. And if you have questions about the COVID vaccines, check FDA's website and YouTube. Polarization, and the last piece of this is polarization on science, I think will impede our future, our future successes. 
now I'm going to turn it to Faye and, and ask Faye from a journalist perspective, how has this been a challenge for you? You fortunately have your podcast where you have more time to think about this. But what about the journalists who have to cover this real time? What are some of your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, you know, one of the challenges for me is that in 2016, I went from being a reporter to being an opinion columnist. And this was sort of an experiment. Bloomberg has a, an opinion page. Um, all the other opinion columnists do business or politics or something else. So they didn't really have someone to do science. They could have picked a scientist, but most scientists are only expert in one field. And I think they wanted to try someone who would do interviews in different fields. But one of the challenges I get as a columnist is people say, how dare you write about that? You're not an expert. So, and you get a lot of that with this pandemic, partly because it's very polarized. The first thing people do when they disagree with what you say is say, well, who are you to say that? You're not allowed to say that. You don't. And you know, I've, I've seen that even with people who have a PhD in some relevant field. Um, and, and why is it so controversial? I'd say um, one reason is that it was, it, it was so new and not well understood. We're not, we don't have this sort of basic science to draw on. Um, the first story I wrote about it was in January of 2020. And I interviewed Peter Sandman, who's sort of a go-to source on risk related things. People were talking about um, the virus in China. It wasn't yet didn't even have a name yet, or it was called the Wuhan virus at the time that that changed. And people weren't outraged yet. I think that's the interesting thing. They did flip. People were, um, you know, experts were concerned. The public was weirdly not outraged or particularly concerned back then. And I thought, well, you know, now that it's sort of getting out to other countries and it, we know it spreads from person to person, this could, could get pretty big. Um, and then once it hit, everything sort of changed very suddenly to, um, you know, doing all of these non-pharmaceutical interventions that had never really been tried against, not, I mean, nothing had been tried against this particular pandemic before, it was all new. And so there were just so many open questions about how do you, how do we know if these things work? And even after many months, I think we haven't gathered as much data as we probably could have on what works and what doesn't. In fact, yeah, I may, I'm talking too long on this one question. I could talk about it forever. I will bring up one thing though. I noticed there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal about China's uh, policies and how they've, they've kept the disease pretty low. And I thought it was an interesting piece that there's something we could learn from them even if we don't wanna emulate them. But I posted something on Twitter and people were outraged. How dare you even think about a totalitarian country? They're dishonest, how could you trust them? And you know, my, my answer was, well, I wasn't saying we should be exactly like them. I was just saying they had a contact tracing system that actually worked and ours never worked. So how, why don't we study that? Because if this disease isn't gonna go away, don't we wanna do better if we get another wave? So I- <laughs> That's a long answer to a short question. Well, related to that, though, if we had done this maybe just three months ago, two months ago, it would have been very different because not just China, but Singapore, which has a very progressive government, Australia, South Korea had COVID under control. And now it's just taking off. So it this shows how tough it is to control. And I don't think I don't think any American and probably most countries of the world would want to live with the kind of restrictions China has. So they are just so far beyond what we would accept as people. But to see that countries that were successful, Japan early on in the pandemic, where now that the number of cases are just incredible, or even Hong Kong now. Yes. I, so, I had my own risk communicate um, risk perception experiment in March of 2020. I, I was taking SEPTA to Philadelphia, and things were still open at the time. But in my class, I used to teach at University of the Sciences. I had been teaching infectious disease since 2006, and the scenario I gave to my students was 
how do you keep your company running during a pandemic? So I've been concerned about this for a very long time. And I actually had a stack of N95s. So I wore an N95 on a SEPTA train and coming home, the train was very crowded and there was a woman sitting next to me, but she was like this on the train. And then when I got off at Yardley, a woman said to me, she goes, are you infected or are we infected? But it just shows how people, the whole idea of a mask was just so foreign to everybody. And well, people assumed that you were infected if you wore a mask and then that changed. But, um, but that does get at something, you know, one of the big, big, I think, challenges with this is it is the kind of risk where it isn't just like smoking where people decide, am I going to smoke or quit? There's, a, I think there's a moral component and that's really different from anything, you know, health risks we've seen before because people are saying you don't have a right to, you know, go out and do activities that might infect other people. And so there's a moral component the, the it's not just your own risk, it's the risk of other people. And then one of the, I mean, the hardest, probably hardest column I ever wrote, the, the one that got the most angry response was one where they asked me to do one on whether we should open the schools back in, this was late summer of 2020. And I interviewed some pediatricians who said, well, schools are really important and beneficial for kids and keeping kids out of school and on Zoom is actually really tough for kids that don't have the resources at home who are already falling behind. And so I, you know, I presented it as something where there were some pretty important benefits to bringing kids back to school, but because that would mean a few kids might get COVID and a few would die, that people were absolutely outraged. How, how could you possibly even think about it, talk about doing something that might kill kids, you know? you're a ghoul, you know, and I was just like, oh, what what? like, I, you know, I was just trying to talk about something where there was a, there were risks to be weighed, but people were very emotional about it, though they did end up deciding it was important to bring the kids back to school. And most people eventually agreed with that. Mm. And you still see those disagreements today and school board members being attacked because they're recommending masks and and other people are frustrated with that. It's, 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 it's really, as a scientist, it's disturbing to see how much polarization there is on this issue and how strongly encamped the different views are that like I'm, I'm concerned today about every word that I say because it could be used later and maybe taken out of context. And it's, it's concerning. Well, you know, it is. It, I have looked at this, and I should mention also that my my podcast is actually premised on a um, a, a fellowship proposal on medical misinformation. So, a topic that's sort of of interest to fact and critical thinking. But I've I've come to see that there are two facets to the polarization. One is really over values that get kind of bled into science, you know, because there are value judgments that we make. What, where do we draw the line between? Um, you know, quality of life and quantity of life, where we say, do we do we put people at a small risk for something as beneficial as um, having a social life or having restaurants open or public school? So we're balancing these different values. And I don't think science can give you the full answer. It can only inform your decision, but eventually you have to make, uh, people have to make very hard choices and policymakers have to make extremely hard decisions about, how we balance things that we value in life. Then there is the sort of areas of where, where people in certain political camps believe in things beyond, you know, beyond what the evidence would support. So um, people on the conservative camp, I think, tended to believe in hydroxychloroquine longer than it was warranted and believed that ivermectin, some still believe ivermectin as the cure. Um, and also really exaggerated the risks of the vaccines. You know, every, every pharmaceutical has a risk, but just magnified those. We'll say, well, these are risky. And, and I think there have been surveys showing that people on the other side actually do overestimate the risk of dying from the virus in all age groups, you know, vastly. And I think that, you know, there was a, something going around that long COVID would mean that a third of our population will end up severely disabled once this pandemic is through, a third of the entire population. And I think that is probably not gonna happen. I think they're conflating a couple of things. A few people who get long COVID may be disabled for the long term. 
a lot of people have symptoms that linger for a month or two, but all of those people are not going to be disabled. So it was sort of a, a conflation of things, but that, that is where there's sort of informational things that get polarized. And then there are things that actually should be hashed out in a political arena because they do, they do involve our values. And as a democratic country, we have to hash those things out. The scientists can't answer those for us. Right. I mean, the, the, the risk benefit of having kids attend school ver versus the risks of getting them, having them get COVID. I mean, just the, the challenges for, for, for really anybody in the population, but certainly certain groups in the pot of our country to try to get their kids to pay attention to an online class. I, I can't imagine how difficult that is. And, and that, and unfortunately, you can't have sort of a measured discussion on that. If you bring it up, you've got both camps that get angry at each other before you can discuss, okay, what's the right choice here for society? Because as you mentioned, that's not a scientist's choice. That's a societal choice. Well, and we're getting to a point when the disease, you know, keep, if it keeps retreating, when do we let the kids not wear masks in school? You know, that's, mm. and there are people that, that think never. And I think a lot of us think, well, that doesn't seem quite right. You know, there must, we should come up with a point at which it's safe enough to let them be in school without a mask. But I think we're going to be hashing that out for a long time. Another thing that I, you know, I thought, well, vaccine boost, I mean, vaccine mandates make a lot of sense because there, there was a pretty big portion of the population that was hesitant and then just, it did sort of push them to, to get going. But I've heard an argument against mandates that wasn't a bad argument. It said, you know, most of us have been vaccinated. There are a few holdouts. A lot of them have had COVID by now. There's probably only about 10% of the population that is completely naive to this, you know, has no immunity. And the, the uh, ability of the vaccines to cut down transmission is much less with Omicron. They do still, this, the science still suggests that you're less likely to get the disease in the first place or transmit it if you're vaccinated, but the effect is not, um, it's not a big effect anymore. And so, you know, the downside of the mandates is that it seems like it does tear our society apart. It's making people very angry and would it, would dropping the mandates you know, our lives being saved by these mandates or, and when they're not, when is the, is the, you know, animosity more of a hazard. So I can also see that these are very, very complex questions. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, without, without the vaccination for those people who get sick, the costs are significant. The country of Singapore made the decision that if you don't get vaccinated and you get sick, the government's not paying for your, your treatment. You've got to pay for it yourself. That's another approach to this, that, that you wonder how that would drive people's decision-making if they, they realized, okay, if I get this, it's going to be really expensive well, to get treated yes, in a course. hospital. <laughs> They're lucky enough that the government pays for their health care. Right. Right. Okay, we're on our own here in the USA, and you know, and and so there are people questioning whether your insurance shouldn't mm. kick in. Though in that case, you know, if you pay some big premium every every month for insurance, is is that fair? I mean, it's a it's a very interesting interesting question to look at that. But I'd say yes, if you and if you have socialized medicine, there is a much different component because you are taking up resources, and the government, if the government is going to give you free health health care, it seems very reasonable that they would want to make sure you got a vaccine that was going to keep you out of the hospital. All right, to our audience, questions, comments, thoughts? Well, if we don't have one, have questions right away, I can throw some back, back at you. Okay. Oh, I'm Okay. Oh, I'm I'm seeing in the Q and A now. Oh, so, okay. um, do you need do you need Becky Ms. to Becky uh, address these for you? Sure, sure. Yeah, Becky, or, why don't you or, ask? Yeah. Or David, Becky. are you going ahead? Your choice. Uh, Becky, you, you, why don't you why don't you present them to us? Okay, I'm not sure if uh, okay. well, Becky's there. I can go forward. That's okay, fine. Thank you, David. Yeah. 
Sure. Um, so one of the questions was, given your experience as science communicators, how would each of you, in hindsight, communicated to the general public about mask wearing, vaccines and boosters, if you were Anthony Fauci? Oh, if I were Fauci, wow. Do you want to, I'll take, can I take that one first? Sure, absolutely. Well, I, I, I really think that people in the long run are, um, that they respond better to uh, transparency, to uh, any kind of rule that makes sense to them. In fact, yeah, there was a psychologist um, put something very wise up on Twitter that people don't mind restrictions when they're meaningful. And so I think what fa what I would have done was been completely transparent early and said, you know, we, we know that these N95 masks work, we don't have enough. Um, we're not really sure whether, you know, a cloth mask will work for your net. We're, we're, we're thinking it might, but we're not sure. Um, just kind of, Go go all out with what you know, what you don't know, and then, as the thinking evolves, then keep saying, "Well, we you know we think that maybe if everybody wore a cloth mask, that might cut down transmission." And right now, we have so many cases that even if they only cut you know ten or twenty percent of cases, that's that's lives saved. So we'd like you to do this. So you know there was just I think a lot of confusion because there was the the, the sense that it wasn't that what he was saying wasn't completely transparent. I still wonder why it took so long once N95s were no longer in short supply to um, get more of those out to the public and encourage people who felt like they were at high risk to, to, to get them. If anything, it seems like the cloth masks were kind of oversold and then there was data that came out recently saying, well, they really are not comparable, but, and people were surprised, but it seemed like we knew that all along and there could have been a more transparent way to, to say, well, yes, you are safer with an N95 and we're gonna make sure we get get those out there in a good supply as soon as we can, but we need them for our healthcare workers early. Okay, this is Becky, I'm back. I just wanna say, I touched something on my computer and I could hear you all, but the Zoom screen was gone. So it took me a couple minutes to figure that one out. And so I am back and we have a question here that I think sure. is a good but, one. Like I, yeah. I just want to follow up for with sure. what Faye was talking about. Sure. With Anthony Fauci, I mean, I have huge respect for him. I mean, talk about a challenging situation in that all the new information had to be interpreted on a daily basis and a decision make, how are we going to present this? And Faye talked about conveying the uncertainty. There's a balance in that. Um, actually, the New, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection or an individual from there a number of years ago did a study, I think it was in the Journal of Risk Analysis, where he had the public read news articles in which the environmental agency emphasize their uncertainty about things. And a lot of the public equated uncertainty with incompetence. And okay, as scientists, we may say, well, that's not correct. You know, they're being honest about their uncertainty, but there's a balance there. I, I do think what Faye said though, conveying to the public that, look, we think N95s are valuable, but we really need them for medical workers. That's a great message to get. But would people have really reacted to that? I don't know. I think so. And also people were supposed to be staying home anyway. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, to, to yeah. people, to do, to, you know, we're, we're locked down right now. We're supposed to be sheltering in place and we'll try to get those masks to you when it's time to come out and interact. Mm. And so maybe that would have been a better message at the time. Um, I, I mean, maybe my instinct as a reporter is to talk about the uncertainty in a way that doesn't make people seem incompetent, that makes them seem more confident. To me, as scientists, that, that's, that's one of the tricks of pseudoscientists, you know, is to, to, to be so sure and not talk about their own uncertainty. You know, I, I, I listened to the entire Joe Rogan podcast with Robert Malone speaking of um, pseudoscience. And even though he's a real scientist, he, um, he used a lot of techniques that are common in pseudoscience, including not, you know, it just no, no sense of uncertainty at all. Just, I know this because I'm, you know, I have credentials and, um, and really emphasized risks of the vaccines that were, I think, unwarranted. So yes, too much, too, so uncertainty is, is a sign that you're, that you're honest and know, <laughs> and kind of know your uncertainty. No, no, you know, quantifying your own uncertainty is, 
important. So sometimes it's the way it's conveyed. And if you're a good science communicator, I think you can get that across that people are uncertain because they have, you know, they're being good scientists, not because they're incompetent. That, that's very good. Um, thank you. And Michael Caro, who's been a, an, often an audience member here, has a compliment for the two of you. Thank you both for handling such a sensitive topic in a very rational manner. Very nice, Michael. And we have a couple more questions that really are different versions of what you two were just talking about. Um, how, do you, how do you communicate things that are true but not complete? Um, there was a big information disconnect between what was occurring in the nation's hospitals and ERs and public perception. And to me, a lot of it has to do with people not understanding that science isn't so much a body of knowledge, but a way of thinking and that it does change day to day and that it is uncertain. And I'm kind of pontificating and not asking a question, but I think that's what you were just, you two were just talking about. Am mm -hmm. I right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, my most recent column for Bloomberg was on this question that the editors were interested in on whether immunity from an infection was equivalent to getting a vaccine. And this is a complete moving target. I mean, we're, we're learn not only are we learning as we go along, but the time out from the infection and the time out from the vaccine matter and the, the, whether you were infected with Delta or the original strain or Omicron and then which, which, which variant is out there. So it's a, you know, this whole pandemic has been more of a moving target than anyone had imagined since we, you know, we try, we're learning about the virus and then it suddenly becomes a very different kind of virus with Delta, then it becomes a different thing again with Omicron. So um, people are, you know, I think it's kind of amazing that people have um, learned as much as they have as fast as they have. And related to that too, I mean, we're lucky that they, companies came up with some very effective vaccines. That doesn't always happen. I mean, multiple vaccines failed, but we did get some very effective ones. And, and we're in a short amount of time and we're really fortunate about that. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Um, we have another question. Did you get the impression, <laughs> yeah, alert the media that some of the journalists were trying to hype things up. Um, did you get the impression that some journalists were going overboard with the bad news of the pandemic, telling people about new normals and how terrible and that sort of thing? Take it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that there, there is a lot of pressure to take a side. I even have had people ask me, which side are you, what side are you? And I'll say, well, I, I, this is science reporting. I don't have, I'm not on a side, but there was a perception that you took the side of saying, you know, it's, it's not as bad as people say. And, and then the other side is the side that's, that's the doom and gloom side. And people tended to get more popular on social media if they took a hard stand on either of those edges. If you were in the middle, it was hard to get all those, you know, gazillion followers on Twitter, though I hope people will follow me on Twitter anyway. But yeah. it's not it's it's it is harder when you <laughs> deal with the sort of complexity of the, the the story in the middle ground. So I would say there has been pressure on both ends for people to downplay it um, if they're depending on the news organization they work for. The, the conservative media, um, so-called conservative media, Fox News, that branch of things, but other yeah branches of the mainstream media, I think there was pressure to um, make it sound like we were all going um, to die. And, and people, surveys have shown that people thought that, you know, about maybe 10 or 20 percent of people who get COVID die, which is much higher than the reality. So um, yeah, there is, there definitely was I pressure on, I think some of that comes from editors, but some of it actually comes from social media, from the pressure that we feel to be popular in social media. There's one question that was submitted I want to cover. It was about, should the government stockpile N95s? And I can tell you, as someone who te taught, teaches infectious disease, I had them stockpiled, not because of COVID, not because I foresaw that, but because infectious disease experts recognize that these things can happen. I mean, when I got started, it was because of specific type of flu called H5N1. It has a 60% human mortality 
but it's not very transmissible. So it has stayed in the background. It still pops up around the world, but it's never become that pandemic disease. Just imagine if that does the gene exchange Faye talked about becomes a pandemic strain. It's really scary. And I think N95s are one of those from a cost perspective, they're, they're something that can be stockpiled. And um, even last July, in the beginning of July, when everybody was no longer concerned about COVID, I got a new stockpile of N95s because they were only 75 cents each on Amazon <laughs> because no one cared about COVID last July, beginning of July. So back to you, Becky. That's, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, last, last July, I looked at my little stockpile of, I think, half a dozen masks and thought, well, what am I going to do with these? <laughs> um, very interesting insight here from Mark This, who's a longtime supporter and uh, audience member of ours. Why is it that people tend to understand the changing nature of the stock market or road conditions that cannot understand the change in nature or our understanding of them and accuse scientists of flip-flopping. Oh, that's a good one. Because <laughs> that I, is very good. <laughs> I've been accused of flip-flopping. I find that is just so that the flip-flopping is the weirdest accusation to 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 um to lob at a scientist because it's the job of scientists and the media covering scientists to to um continue to change with changing evidence and even sometimes. Uh, admitting to being wrong if you're on a hypothesis that's wrong. And somebody asked me recently about why people like um, some of the <coughs> people, these doctors that have been um, promoting ivermectin and telling people not to get vaccinated, sort of where they went astray, you know, because some of them are trained as scientists and doctors. And, and, you know, and we all know there are scientists who promote pseudoscience for different for different reasons. And one is that they get stuck on something, a hypothesis they came up with that they can't let go of. They will not just say, okay, I was wrong. You know, that's true of somebody I, I have written about, Peter Duisberg, who early on thought that HIV didn't cause AIDS. There was a legitimate debate at some point about what caused AIDS. Eventually there was overwhelming evidence. It was this virus HIV, but he never let go of the idea that it didn't. And I think that's that flip-flopping is what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Sometimes people do it too late, but better late than never, that it's not flip-flopping that really makes scientists go off the rails and end up becoming pseudoscientists. I, I often try to find these things for my class because I teach risk assessment and critical thinking. I like to find things that I don't wanna believe, I can't imagine are true, but then when I read the evidence, I realize, you know, they are correct. And we won't go into this, but for example, high efficiency irrigation, that's gotta be good for the environment, right? It's gotta reduce water use and, and use it more effectively by farmers. Yet there are multiple studies worldwide that say when you introduce high efficiency water, irrigation systems in farms, you deplete groundwater quickly, you reduce um, river recharge more to the point where there was a publication last year that called it a zombie idea. I've never seen the word zombie used in a scientific publication before, but it was. <laughs> and it's because, like I'm sure everybody here in this are going, no, that can't be true. That can't be true. Well, that's how I felt. And that's why I teach it in class because my thinking changed completely. And I don't see that as flip-flopping. I see that as someone who reads the science. Yes, yes. Um, we have another question. With so much information, misinformation coming to the fore, could you envision the FCC or another agency taking the lead not to censor, but to label information sources as highly reliable, less reliable, unreliable? That's a great question. I, wow. I get because I just actually wrote a piece, of, an opinion piece for Stat News for their opinion section, a freelance piece, and I've written a couple of pieces on this for Bloomberg. And I, I think I mean, one of the things that makes a media source credible is accountability. 
and that used to be the standard, you know, when I wrote for the Philadelphia Inquirer or for Science Magazine, for any of the publications I've written for, my name was there. Um, people, there, there was a letter section, people could call us. If somebody called me and said, I'm a scientist and I'm in the field you just wrote about and you got some things wrong, I would be obligated to listen and then obligated to either run a correction or if it was complicated, I would write a follow-up story or a follow-up column. It's one reason I like being a columnist because you can keep updating things. So, you know, there are, there's a lot of news out there that's not accountable. You don't, people don't even know where it comes from. It's on social media and it gets amplified. And I think social media has gone a long way toward amplifying the least credible claims. You know, things get yes. sort of mixed up, um, you know, news sources that are real, news sources that are fake, news sources that are somewhere in between. Uh, ones that are not accountable to anybody if they get something wrong. And then the algorithm will amplify what is, you know, what is popular. But I've, I've written about some experiments that show that you can actually use crowdsourcing to get an approximation of how accurate things are. There are different techniques you can do. They're not perfect, but you could actually redo the algorithms on Twitter to make the most likely to be accurate claims go, go to the top instead of the most outrage generating and, and sensational. So I think our social media could be improved. And I've said that I don't think that the Joe Rogan show, it's the, sort of a symptom, but the reason that he has these people that are questionable on the show is that Twitter made them famous, that yeah. he has people on who are already famous. He doesn't make them famous. Those quacks that are on his show, that social media made them famous. So I, I would like to see something where our social media can can actually be used for good instead of bad. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> there was just an article in Nature Reviews in uh, January of this year, and they talk about an issue too, is once people get information, if, it, if it's corrected, if you need to correct it, there's a big hurdle to correct it. And that initial information can also influence what they already know and any new information that they learn. So that's another challenge with something like COVID as well. It's so, so quickly developing. It happens so fast to society that, that it's hard to overcome that initial misinformation that people thought was correct. And there are a lot of assumptions, you know, I've been interviewing people from the beginning about, well, not from the beginning, I guess from about the middle when we realized that the, the, the disease was going up and down in waves and it would be going up here and then going up there and then going down here. And then, you know, and that the winter wave last year started to decline way before the vaccines were out um, widely and before the weather really changed. And the, the scientists really didn't have a good understanding of that. You know, they're, they're getting, a, you know, getting some clues, but there's still not a good understanding. They sort of knew that the wave, the Omicron wave was gonna go down fast because it did in South Africa, but, and they had seen it happen before, but they don't completely understand why. So it is, it is interesting, but people make a lot of assumptions. They say, well, it's because people are doing this or doing that or wearing their masks more. This, but we, it, it seems, I think people overestimate the role of um, politicians, of even of policies, because people's behavior will, is often sort of independent of policy. People don't always follow the rules. People often take sa safety precautions beyond what is expected. And the rules have been sort of cobbled together. There were a lot of rules here in Rhode Island that were taken away that never made a lot of sense. And then, you know, we're starting to get more sensible. But it's interesting to me that people sort of made a lot of assumptions about why these waves were going up. Usually, well, it's because the we don't, you know, the, they have a Republican governor there, but then it would, you know, Rhode Island had the biggest Omicron wave of any state in the country. And we have a mask mandate and all of the other, you know, all the things that blue states are supposed to have. And I would ask people, why us? And there are a variety of reasons, but um, it is it's a, it is a very complicated to try to understand it. Yeah. If I had one piece of scientific information for on, on these pandemics would be relative importance of routes of exposure. In other words, how much of the disease is coming via inhalation? How much is it coming from touching surfaces? What's, what's a quantitative estimate on that? Now, I'm not being brilliant in asking this question. I think it was in 2008, a National Academy of Sciences 
um, report on preparing for the next next pandemic ask that question. And of course, we don't have that information. It'd probably be difficult to calculate. But if we knew the relative importance or how much of the disease happens when you're inside, how much outside, I think that would help our decision makers make better decisions. But I think it would help the public as well if they knew relative importance. Of yes. Something. And, you know, I wrote a story in, in early in, in um, like, I think late May of 2020 about researchers that were, were using contact tracing to figure out where people were getting it. So they could say, okay, this person got it. They'd get their contacts. They say, okay, so they, they were in contact with this person at this restaurant or this hair salon or this and they learned a lot from doing this. And so contact tracing can be useful partly to alert people, but also it was really uh, really a smart way to figure out how the disease was actually getting transmitted. Because people would say, okay, I was with that person in this setting, you know? And that was how they really figured out that yeah, outdoors wasn't, it was a very minor component, if anything, and that people were getting it in more enclosed spaces, but they might not be um, they might be further than six feet away because it really was more airborne than they originally thought. So I don't know. I think it's too bad that we don't, we in the U.S. haven't done more of those kinds of studies because we're still sort of, we, we still are a little bit at a loss as to which situations are the ones that are most risky. I think a lot of people felt, and not me, but I think a lot of people felt con contact tracing was invading their privacy. You know, whose business is it of yours who I was? Yeah, and I guess, I'm yeah. not saying I agree with it. No, I, and I, I, and I, friends of mine would say that. And I'd say, yeah, but it, 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 if it were approached a different way, like, you know, this is for, for the scientific understanding of mm -hmm. how this, and you, we aren't gonna tag your friend and make your friend, you know, be in jail for two weeks, but we just, <laughs> Well, you know, but, but we do want to know how this is, how this is transmitted. And also, I mean, if we, and we had such a shortage of tests now that we have tests, people don't have to lock themselves inside for, for two weeks, you know, they yeah. can get a test. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. and, yeah. and they, Becky, even I, they don't need to tag anybody because we're all tagged when we get the uh, vaccine, right? It's, it's inserted in right. that kind it's of little needle. Yeah. <laughs> That was a joke, everybody. Yes. No, um, there is a question here, kind of turning- Becky, I wanted to go oh, back to a previous oh, question sure. though, about Absolutely. Fauci and the vaccines. There's one yeah. thing that I came across which really changed perspective. And I think it would have been helpful for everybody to understand. One of the concerns was the rapidity, how quickly the vaccines were tested and approved. And there's actually two very concrete reasons for that. One is normally when you run a clinical trial, it takes a long time to recruit volunteers. In this case, lots of people wanted to volunteer. The second reason is when you study a vaccine for infectious disease, you have to get enough people in the placebo, in the people who didn't get the vaccine, enough people have to get the disease so you can statistically show that the vaccine reduced the disease. Well, the unfortunate thing with COVID is lots of people were getting it. So the, the mm -hmm. speed with which the, the sleep placebo group got the disease was much faster than you might with another infectious disease. And mm -hmm. it's two of those key things, plus decades of research before, mm -hmm. that allowed us to rapidly assess the eff efficacy of these mm -hmm. vaccines. And that's something I would have liked to have shared with the public. That's yeah. a really important point. Yes, because we br people bring that up a lot. Oh, they're so fast. They were done too fast. And to, to say, well, it is because the disease was so prevalent because we got that huge wave in the winter of 2020, 2021. If we hadn't had that huge wave, it would have taken longer. Yeah. All, all the people who said, I'm not getting the vaccine. I don't want to be in a clinical trial. And the response was, guess what? You are. Yeah. <laughs> You're the placebo group. You're the placebo arm. Right? Yeah. I, I, you know, and, and meaning, I mean, I don't mean that sarcastically at all, but mm, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> you provided a lot of data. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a, a very um, practical kind of question that I wondered a little bit about myself. 
keeping in mind that if I were having surgery, I would want the surgeon to wear a mask the entire time. But people do have questions about, does it cut off proper inhalation and exhalation? Are you breathing your own bad air? Is it unhealthy to wear a mask? Do you have a response? I, I think there, that the people have looked at that and there isn't much evidence of that. I think that, you know, there's, this is like one of the hardest topics to write about ever is like whether little kids should have to wear a mask all day in school, mm -hmm. whether that actually makes it, impedes their ability to communicate with each other um, and whether they, you know, they aren't really socializing or enjoying school as much as they would. Maybe that doesn't matter when the pandemic is raging and people are dying, maybe when it, calms down a little. It's, a, it's something to be balanced in. Again, there's sort of an intangible thing that you're comparing, you know, quality of life for kids in school. And I think that's just something that I hope we can hash out without being too angry with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to add some technical side to that too, in terms of breathing bad air, that's really, are you breathing too much CO2? And the answer is no. And Pre-pandemic, N95s were used by medical workers, but they're also used by regular workers who worked in areas where there were high levels of particulates. And a worker could work safely wearing an N95, even though, yes, it reduces your ability to breathe a little bit, but not in a way that's hazardous to health. So, so the that bad air is really just your CO2 and your body self-regulates. If you need to breathe a little more, you breathe a little more. But N95s are, are designed from an engineering perspective. They're not just a coffee filter. There's a lot of engineering into them. And in terms of how they work. And a key part of that is they were designed for workers. They were designed for people who work in jobs that take strenuous work. So the, the idea that that presents a health risk, th there could be a very, very small one, but it's, it's, it's not something I would be concerned about. I would take an N95 any day. But yeah, whether we should ask elementary school kids to wear one all day, I think that's a harder question. And we'll, society will have to, I hope, have a, you know, a, a, a reasoned debate about risks and benefits. I don't think that little kids necessarily should have to wear them at recess, but they, a lot of schools require that and um, make them like go outside at lunch. So there may be, you know, things, this is all, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a sort of a di slightly different category. Um, people for a while were wearing um, masks to exercise outside. I think that probably isn't necessary, but you know, people have their own, people could choose to do that and that's fine. And then I, I saw one question about how do we improve the science and logic of critical thinking in elementary school, high school, edu adult education. When I started teaching at University of the Sciences, my first year, my course was just called risk assessment, but I decided it had to include critical thinking. And part of that was because of my involvement with facts and the course became risk assessment, critical thinking and health. And through that, I found an organization called the Foundation for Critical Thinking. And their view is at any age, you can use critical thinking in teaching. And things I learned from them helped me immensely, both teaching at the graduate level, PhDs and MBAs, but also kids in school. I give talks in school to kids about toxicology. And one of their views or one of their perspectives is, is you can't just go give people new information. You have to discover what they know incorrectly as well and work on that in both ways. So when I talk to kids in school, I ask them a lot of questions because by asking them questions, I can see their understanding and target my, my discussion to that. So to that question, I think we can achieve it. It's maybe not that easy, but I, I do think that that's achievable. I do too. I think it should be part of the way science is taught and it can be. I agree. Uh, what happened to contract contact tracing? Ah, is it yeah. gone? It, well, that's it. I mean, and it, it still, it seems to be do, being done in China and it didn't, it just didn't seem to, 
um, people kind of stopped after the vaccines came out, thinking uh, we really wouldn't need it. I think that yeah. that was, and it, it caught people by surprise. You know, I think we actually were headed for herd immunity against the version of the virus that the vaccine was designed to fight. And then Delta came along and that was, <laughs> the folks were dashed. And also it was more transmissible. It was, Delta was more transmissible and then Omicron was more transmissible. So I think those complicated it because people were actually getting it and more likely to get it from someone that was in a room with them, you know, maybe on the other side of the room that the earlier version, it was, it was a little more doable because people were in closer, con had to be in closer contact to get it. And so they did, were able to sort of find the, these chains of transmission. I think it just became overwhelming because also it's these big waves. So you, when you could contact trace would be when you have a, sort of a manageable number of cases. So as I said, I think we should have still kept it all along just to keep gathering data on how it's being transmitted, whether surfaces were a factor at all or a non-issue. Um, what, you know, the, the issue of is, are, is the supermarket the big risk people think it is, or is it restaurants where people, you know, they wear a mask for what, 5% of the time they're in there, you know, and so I think it would be very helpful to, to give people a sense of where, where are people getting it? You know, I see these numbers in, in these statistics on how many cases there are and how many people in the hospital. I think, how do these people get it? You know, these are people that a lot of the hospitalized people are high risk people. Did they do things that they knew were risky or was there something weird that happened? Or how, you know, I, I, I would like, I think we would all like to know um, where, you know, where, how the disease is being transmitted and where. Good point. Um, Dave, you warned us in our March 2020 fact meeting, which was our last face-to-face -face meeting, you said, and I think you had just come back from China, you said COVID was going to be big. And I want you to know, I've known Dave 20 years now. I take you very, very seriously, but that just didn't resonate with me because I had no reference for it in my life. Um, and so I, that's, it's kind of a comment and apology that you didn't even know <laughs> I needed to make, but we, we have, what I think might be our last question here. How can we prepare the public for the next pandemic to be ready for it, but also to avoid the polarization that we have on this one? Wow. I mean, I guess that's, that's a hard one because I think we were so polarized before this pandemic that I think continuing to discuss it and talk about it and maybe think about the way people are getting their information through social media. I would like to see um, people sort of go, well, of course I'm biased. I like the mainstream media because <laughs> I'm part of it, but yeah, I think so do I. Have an obligation to the public to provide a certain quality of information and accountability, but maybe we could sort of um, have better, you know, adult education and discussions about misinformation and how our political, I would like to see more social science on how people's political views can pull them toward bad information. And I've seen a little bit of that, just, you know, why do people, why does being politically conservative make you wanna believe in ivermectin? You know, why would that yeah, even be? Really? <laughs> But if, I think if the more we study that, so social scientists have done some interesting work and I, I hope to write more about their work in trying to understand people's attitudes and beliefs that aren't always rational. And, and I would just say, this is a question that has existed for decades in that um, there's been long-term concerns about infectious disease risk. And the problem, it's just human nature. Once it's no longer on the front page, once it's no longer, once the risk seems lower, we're not as concerned about it. We had SARS, that, that uh, the, the initial SARS disease that jumped across the world, that was about 10% more mortality, but the number of people exposed remained small. And after it went away, we stopped caring. Infectious disease experts continue to care, but from a societal perspective, it's tough to keep that, that interest of people. So how do we teach people better about that? It's a wonderful question. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I, we have a comment here. Um, 
from Ed Gracely. Thanks, Ed. My sense is that many people who believe false things, including QAnon and flat earth vaccine skepticism, consider themselves critical thinkers. Um, and yes, I, I, I agree. They absolutely think they are. And the rest of us are sheep who just believe the supposedly reliable sources that are actually just hiding the truth. Here's his question. How do we respond to that? Here's a question for the ages. Oh, that is a good question. Yeah. Hey, um, could I start though? Yeah. Yeah. You go for that because that one is a tough one because they do actually, think. Actually, Eric taught me this early on, in fact, we were in a meeting and he said, you know, we all have things in our lives that we're not, we're not strong enough critical thinkers of about. And before he said that, I thought, you know, I teach critical thinking. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not like that. But then I realized it's that. true. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll give a personal example. When I would read something new about cigarettes causing another form of cancer, I tended to believe it uncritically. Now, I had reason to believe that. I mean, <laughs> The cigarettes have thousands of carcinogens in them. And I know as a toxicologist, they could cause cancer in multiple organism, organs of the body, but I didn't stop and critically evaluate it as much as maybe I should. So I think just that statement from Eric in my life has always made me stop and think, okay, I see it this way. Could there be another, another way of looking at this that I'm not seeing? That's the way I would approach it. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I one of my podcast episodes is with a historian Michael Gordon, who writes about pseudoscience and about the 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 fact that historically, you know, some of the greatest physicists and astronomers were astrologers, and um, or they dabbled in alchemy, you know. So and things that were on the so I think his latest book is called From Fringe to Fact and Back Again. And so I think, you know, knowing a little bit about that history can keep us, um, I guess, thinking about how these things can be separated, that science, there's always an uncertainty, but that the odds are on, you know, odds are usually on the, the, the side with the evidence that you don't, you know, you keep open to the possibility that there's something wrong with our physical view of the world. It's also just a good exercise to say, okay, how do we, how do we prove that, that, you know, the earth isn't flat or whatever you want to try to prove to people. There are lots of, you know, there are, there are good scientific arguments. It's good to keep on your toes just to explain basic science. And I do that with, I did that a lot in my evolution column with creationists. I tried to step back and explain why, what the, what the, the real strength of the argument for evolution was and what the real strength of the argument for um, carbon dioxide causing climate change, what the, what the strength of that argument was. And I think um, sometimes it, it helps us all to go back to basics and be able to sort of walk ourselves and other people through that and not take that, take them for granted. I love doing this with Faye because she always makes me think of other things. To, to the point of fighting pseudoscience, I'm actually writing a piece for the Toxicology Education Foundation on the word alchemy and chemist. In fact, that differentiation between alchemy being pseudoscience and chemistry being science happened about the years around the year 1600. That, um, that previous to that, and, and it's not an exact line, it's around then. The word alchemy and chemistry were used interchangeably. And it's a word we actually got from Arabic. And some European translators realized that al just means the in Arabic. So it really just meant the chemistry. Hmm. So if they do Arabic, they dropped it off the word and just used the word chemistry, where other people just use the word alchemy, they use them interchangeably. But in by about 1600, they realized that scientifically, you couldn't convert mercury into gold. That was pseudoscience. And the differentiation of those terms began. So this is a, this is something we've been fighting for hundreds of years. And also it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to debate pseudoscience if you don't know the pseudoscience. So I was involved in a debate with some UFO people and they were just like appalled at how little UFOlogy I knew. And so I wasn't in a good position. I did as a little plug for my podcast, do an episode on QAnon where I learned about what it is and why people believe in it. And I talked to some social scientists who had looked at QAnon and there are some really interesting reasons that people are drawn to it that have to do with the way it sort of gives you the illusion you're connecting a lot of dots in a very satisfying 
sort of way. And that sometimes people who are intelligent in terms of their creative abilities can, can get drawn into something like that. So I learned a lot just like learning about what QAnon was and why so many people would be drawn to something that sounds so absurd on the surface. That's interesting. We had Michael Marshall um, a year ago. He was our last February speaker talking about flat earth, but a lot of what he was talking about was how to talk about, talk to people who have what we consider to be strange beliefs. And one of the points he made repeatedly was make sure you understand what they're talking about. You know, if they say flat earth, exactly what do they believe about that? It was very interesting. And I wanted to bring up something else that I read recently online, because um, that's where I get my news. An old English legal uh, statement, that which is known, I, I just had to write it down to make sure I could get it up. That which is known does not have to be proven. And this was brought up when a Holocaust survivor successfully sued some Holocaust deniers. I forget mm -hmm. the details, but he, he won a settlement and they kept saying to him, well, you have to prove the Holocaust happened. And, and the, you know, obviously we have plenty of proof, yeah. but that which is known doesn't have to be. That's, proven. yes. I, and that's a, that's a really important point. Burden of proof is a big issue. Who has the burden of proof? In science, it's, it's well established. The burden of proof is on whoever has to over, who's ever, who's trying to overthrow the, the current theory. But, right, but if somebody is saying the Holocaust didn't happen, how do you, how I don't know how they would prove it. Of course, on the person that's yeah, that's making this outrageous yeah. claim. Yeah, not on the people that are, are were there and say no, I was. You yeah. know, yeah. here's is, my proof on my arm. Uh, yeah, I, exactly. I, I, I mean, yeah. there's some point where it it bleeds into you know craziness, not yes. just craziness, but where yes. people are, yes like have imbalanced thoughts <laughs> yes yeah yeah and it, it it seems simple that which is known well how do we know it's it's mm. uh, yeah it's interesting um uh, one one of our uh, board members just to comment the person who introduced the concept of liquid crystals was originally thought to be a crackpot now liquid crystals are profusely used in technology and and that's true a lot of a lot of the big breakthroughs in science, they were laughed at at first. And then uh, somebody said, it's not enough that they laugh at you, you have to be right. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> they're also, <laughs> for every one they laughed at that's right, there are a hundred that they laughed at and actually they turned out to be wrong. Yes, yes. yes. And then yes. we hear about the one. And then there are also ones where they didn't laugh that much. You know, they, they, were, they were rightly skeptical because science would be all over the place if every new idea got accepted. You right, have, right. You have a high burden. Right. And it has to go through the cauldron of fire. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So. And I think, Becky, that's one of the challenges with COVID. It hasn't gone, the scientific information hasn't gone through that cauldron of fire. I mean, there's been so much published, so much information in trying to bring that all together in a, with what we know for certain, what we know with or great certainty, what we were uncertain about and what we have no idea about is, mm -hmm. is still to be completely put together. Right. Yeah, right. including questions about where COVID came from. And and mm -hmm. there are a lot of differing ideas about how the virus is evolving and where the new variants came from. But where, you know, where COVID came from is still an open question that may never be, it may never be solved. Um, but it's, uh, you know, uh, for a while people didn't want to think it could have come from a lab then they decided maybe they should think about it but the um the evidence is is just not there to really back anything in particular well thank you both of you very much this this was very interesting and in that, that we got a lot of chats we got a lot of good questions um yeah i say i think we're gonna it was fun. Thank sure. you. Well, I'm glad it was fun. And, you know, you both have been, I say you've been a friend of fact for a long time. And uh, David has been a wonderful board member and, and guided us for a long time. So thank you very much. I think that Eric has a couple, I uh, do you have a couple things to say about what's coming yeah, up. Yeah, just very uh, briefly want to reiterate your uh, thanks to these two wonderful people who dedicated so much of their life to uh, to 
uh, s spreading real science and truth and trying to stand up against falsehood. And I wanted uh, to thank our audience for being here and welcome them to hopefully please join us March 19th for a talk uh, from Robert Bartholomew on mass hysteria. Mass so. hysteria, are we tilting at windmills? <laughs> yes. So, okay. Goodbye, everybody. All right. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Take yep. care.